Hello there, everybody. This is Andrew Kolsky with Stop My OCD, and I'm excited today to have Rulin Guler, who is a psychology student with OCD, but also a lot of uh, background training in psychology, and she's going to be sharing with us today her story. So Rulin, welcome, and please uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Well, good morning, and thank you for having me. Um, my name is Rulin. I'm from New York. Um, I'm a psychology student. I'm finished my master's. I'm looking to get a PhD. And yeah, so I do have OCD. That's one of the main reasons why I went into this field um, to learn more and also to reach out to other people that may have OCD as well. Great, great. Well, thank you for being here to share your story. Mm -hmm. So you and I had an opportunity to speak a little bit before today's podcast, and I found it, you know, interesting. Can you share with us, when did you first have any idea that there was even something going on, whether you even knew if it was OCD, but take us through the very beginning of recognizing something was happening. Okay. Um, so it really started when I was about 12 to 13, and I just kind of, you know, I was told that I was um, becoming a teenager and, you know, and I was like, okay, you know, I guess this is happening to everybody. Um, and then I went into high school and about freshman, sophomore year, um, I, I was still like that, um, feeling anxious and, you know, sometimes getting panic attacks. Um, and then I went through high school like that and then I graduated um, I went to my, get my bachelor's and then I graduated and then I really didn't do anything about my OCD until I graduated college, um, which is not the best thing, but so I, I found out, I felt kind of anxious and weird a while back, but I didn't end up doing anything about it until I graduated from college and so I, I started um, feel, overthinking a lot, getting panic attacks, and I was like, this is not normal. So I went to my doctor, and she, um, she just told me it was generalized anxiety, prescribed some medication, and that's how that started off. Um, and after that, um, should I go into my whole story? at this point sure. well well let's let me let me let me back up a little bit and ask a, okay. a couple questions here so okay. so you said you know initially you started to feel that there was something going on back in high school and as a teenager and that maybe it was just normal teenage things w were there any particular types of obsessive thoughts that you were having or did you just feel anxious tell us more about what was actually happening definitely um I paid, I didn't really start paying attention to my thoughts until after college, like I said, but when I think back, I realize why I was, I was just paying attention to how I felt and what was, and not what was going on in my head. And when I think back, yes, there was definitely um, triggering things for me, including um, like religious sub subjects, um, for example, I wasn't um, raised, too religiously, but for some reason, it's always been um, a trigger point for me. Mm -hmm. So, for example, maybe if I didn't pray before going to sleep that night, then I'm going to overthink about that. I'm like, I'm, I just sinned. I'm not, you know, and like my parents are not like that at all. So I don't know where this comes. So I know it's disorderly thinking, you know, um, and I know that I wasn't that religious of a person to begin with. So I know that that's, you know, not normal thinking. And um, it kind of evolved into relationship OCD when I got into a relationship after, mm -hmm. um, um, before college. Mm -hmm. so, so when you were first dealing with these types of thoughts and the anxiety that you had, did your friends, like, did you notice your friends acting the same way or did you notice that hmm there's something different here about the way I'm feeling than the way my friends the same age are feeling 
Yes, definitely. Um, definitely. And I would confide in my boyfriend too. And he was like, that, I don't think you should be thinking about that, you know? And then, so, and I, and then I would think, okay, there's clearly something wrong here. Um, but, um, so they, I was lucky that they were really understanding, but yes, def there's definitely comparing, um, going on and I I was pretty high functional you know and I'm still high functional that's what she said I had um I have high functional OCD so it's really it's um on the inside it's not easy but on the outside I I make it look easy to kind of hide it and hide what's going on in my head you know mm -hmm. um so yeah and I I def I was but what, the more you hide it the more it kind of you lash out I noticed that I I was really irritable. I would kind of snap at things, um, get mad quickly. And that was all because I was pushing in um, those feelings and not letting them out, not processing those thoughts, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so you, you shared with me that one of the main types of obsessive thoughts you had is related to relationship issues. Mm -hmm. And can can you share with the audience any more details about that? Like what what types of thoughts might someone have if they have relationship OCD? Yeah, of course. Um, I didn't even know relationship OCD existed until I had it. Um, so the, when I first heard about it, um, I was listening to a podcast and um, they had a guest on there who was talking about his um, relationship OCD and he was like I feel so guilty about this I feel so guilty about that and I'm like I feel the exact same way and my specific um, obsessions and compulsions were along the lines of me overthinking about my relationship whether I actually love my boyfriend um, or I do I love him as much as he loves me and if I don't then what does that mean? Uh, just very difficult, like a lot of difficulty with uncertainty, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm out, for example, if I was outside and I saw somebody um, that I thought was attractive, then I would feel really, really guilty about that, like as if I did something wrong. But I mean, it, it is just a thought, but that's not how I felt back in the day. I thought it was a terrible terrible thing like it's gonna ruin my relationship you know so that was the obsessive thinking and then my compulsion was to I gotta tell him this like I have to be honest I he needs to know about this or like you know I'm lying even though nothing happened it was just a thought I'm not lying you know um but yeah and then I would tell him and then it would give me a little bit of a relief Mm -hmm. As soon as I told him, like, hey, I just saw somebody that I thought was cute, um, you know, and I felt really guilty about it. And if I told him, I would feel immediate relief. And that's that's um, a part of it, that when you when you're compelled and you do that um, compulsion, like in my instance, it was telling him how I felt and my, you know, wrongful thinking as I thought Um I felt immediately better, but obviously that wasn't, that was kind of kicking the can down the road. It wasn't a solution. It was just kind of an immediate relief that I felt. Um, but it, it would come back and then it was the next day, it was a different thing that I would obsess about. And then I feel like I would be compelled to tell him again, you know, and over and over again, every single day about different things, different triggers. I reached to a point where I couldn't even watch um, TV shows anymore because I would just be triggered by, you know, couples on the TV show or, um, you know, or if I saw somebody else that was attractive, like I would just be constantly triggered by everything. Mm -hmm. And it just was not a good time. And I remember actually, I went to the movies um, about two years ago with my best friend and we were watching the Joker actually, it was the Joker movie. So this probably wasn't a good combination because that movie's kind of stressful, but <laughs> I um, I got really triggered at a certain point in the movie and I started obsessing and I was in the theater and I was getting really, really stressed out. 
and I had a full on panic attack in the middle of the theater um, just because I was obsessing and I couldn't like um, get the compulsion to tell somebody like get that out because I was in the theater, you know, um, so I had to step out and I had to go to the bathroom. It was a terrible, terrible time. And I knew at that point, like, I need to do something about this because like this is too much. So um yeah so those and that's when i decided to go get help mm -hmm. um, pretty much okay yeah. so so i want to talk about the help you got in a second but before we do that just one last follow-up question yeah. so you are compulsing by telling your boyfriend whenever you see someone else who you think is attractive or or mm -hmm. these types of things how did your boyfriend react was he did he understand what was going on or what was his reaction? Um, so I'm very lucky that he's um, super understanding because I don't think everybody would have reacted the same way he did. Mm -hmm. um, he would just be like, you know, you're not the only one. I see um, a girl that I think is attractive sometimes, you know, and then I was like, oh, really? Like, and that's not that, like, that's OK. And then like he was like, yeah, that's fine. You know, we're humans like we're you know and like he really even though he doesn't know anything about psychology like it's just his own instinct to kind of be leveled I guess and just rational I, I don't know so I at that point I was thinking irrationally so he really like balanced me out um obviously he didn't really like hearing some of these things um and that may have put a little bit of a strain on our relationship but we always um talked about everything um thanks to me since I had to tell him everything you know and he had to listen and talk back um but obviously he didn't like hearing some of the things um but he was always really understanding and you know he knew that I, I always let him know that I loved him like that didn't change it's just these thoughts that I'm having I don't like it and I feel like you should know Mm -hmm. And he did appreciate my honesty. He thought I, at times I was being a little too honest and upfront. And he said that I don't need to tell him some of the things that I tell him, you know, they can just be a thought in my head and I can like forget about it. I don't need to like tell him everything. So he did. Um, He did. Even though it was about him, he was the one that helped me through a little bit, too. Right. So, right. Wow, well, that's mm -hmm. great that you have someone who's so understanding and and supportive. That's that's really yeah. helpful yeah. in these situations. Mm -hmm. um, so you said that you know eventually you decided to go out and get some help. So tell us, who did you go to? What did you get in response to your request? And walk us through that. Alrighty. So um, it, around here, um, I live in upstate New York, and it's not that easy to just kind of go to a therapist or a psychologist um you know so you have to go th go through your primary care doctor and then they have to kind of reference you to somebody so I just had a regular checkup um doctor's appointment and then I went and I just started telling her how I felt um I was like listen I'm feeling really anxious I'm having these thoughts and I don't feel good um and she was like, okay, like, um, we have a counselor, you know, and then I can prescribe some medication. And at that time, I didn't want to talk to a therapist because I didn't understand what I was going through. At the same time, I felt guilty. And I was like, if I share this, then it's going to become real. And it's not just going to be a thought in my head, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was like really reserved and scared um, to start therapy. So we just started with the medication. Um, I just took 10 milligrams of Prozac. Um, they use that medication for depression, anxiety, um, and OCD too. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I started. Um, a year or two went by. I wasn't um, feeling well. And during that year or two, we alternated to like 20 milligrams, came back down because I felt worse at 20 milligrams. Um and she diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder um but and I was like yes that's somewhat true but that's not the root of the issue I knew that it was way more specific than that and I knew that 
I do feel anxious, but I feel anxious because of my thoughts and my irrational thinking. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just the generalized anxiety. Um, so I, I started um, telling her that, and then she was like, I think I re I think you should really um, see somebody. And then, so that's when I was like, okay, I guess, you know, I will give this a chance. So then I started seeing a counselor and um, she really asked me in depth questions. And that kind of brought a light bulb in my head too, because it made me realize when I was a child, how much, um, OCD thinking I had and I didn't even realize and I was like did this just start um you know after high school like what happened to me but I was like wait I've I always had like symptoms you know um and tick disorder is a little different but I realized that I had um I had a lot of ticks growing up and that kind of goes with OCD mm -hmm. um I had like you know facial tics um stuff like that they would go away, come back when I would get like more anxious, you know? Um, and I was like, wait, you know, this is all starting to kind of make sense. Um, so yeah, I went to her and then I was like, I told her specifically how I was feeling. And that was, I described it as like an itch, as like a bug bite. Um, you want to just keep itching it. Like you want to keep itching it maybe to the point, like it bleeds, you know? But realistically, you don't have to itch it, you know, you could just kind of deal with the itch, you know, yes, it's hard, but yeah. you could ignore it, you know, so I kind of um, start to learn to ignore that itch, the itch being the thoughts, like if a thought came, I'd be like, okay, this is not the best thought that I'm having, but it's a thought, you know, and, but before that, I would think about something and then I would think about it and think about it, think about it over and over again until I was like having a panic attack. You know, I would just send myself off to a full blown panic attack because of a certain thought. Um, and so with the combination, I, when we um, when I told her about these things, we did a Y box test and which is um um very uh um popular test for OCD um we did that test and it turns out that I do have OCD um and specifically relationship OCD she said um I was high functioning and that's why she just my other doctor um diagnosed me with just anxiety since I you know I it wasn't inhibiting me in my daily life as much but on the inside it was I was just kind of going through the motions going yes I was going to work but I felt terrible on the inside I did not feel good you know mm -hmm. um so yeah so and when we found out that I had OCD we increased my medication because um you know they said the low dose that I was on wasn't going to do anything um it was a whole different story now. So yeah. Yeah. So so let me let me uh just take a, a break for a second here and uh share a couple things with the audience uh to bring them up to date on a few things. So yes. you you shared that you went to your primary care physician, you explained your situation, you got diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder you knew that there was something more than that, but that's what the diagnosis was. Yes. And the reason I point that out is because, uh, and for those people who've watched some of my other uh, videos, they, they hear me say this all the time. For whatever reason, OCD generally is not taught in school. So whether you are a medical doctor, whether you're a psychiatrist, whether you're a mental health counselor, psychologist, all these different professions, they don't really teach OCD. And mm -hmm. so people don't have a frame of reference to be able to properly diagnose because they've never heard of it or they never heard of what it really is. They assume it means you wash your hands a lot. Exactly. And so in many, 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 many cases, OCD gets misdiagnosed as generalized anxiety disorder. And 
With that diagnosis, in your case, you're prescribed medication, which is one of the things that will be done. And it, you got exactly what normally happens. They prescribe medication, but they prescribe it at the typical dose for depression or anxiety. Well, the medications need a much higher dose when they're prescribed for OCD. And again, many people, they just don't know it because they haven't you know, learned about it. So, you know, that's one of the things that I wanted to point out is that it's always important, like you did, to, to be able to say, you know, I, I, I hear your diagnosis, but it's just, I don't know, it's just not right. There's something else going on and to pursue it. And also just to, to understand that, you know, medications are different in terms of, you know, the, the worst thing is when someone comes to me and they say, well, I already tried that medication. It didn't work. And it's like, well, you tried it at such a low dose for OCD. Mm -hmm. Of course it doesn't work. It's, it's not enough. Um, right. So that, that's always an issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to just share with the audience a little bit more is you said that you experienced some tics. And mm -hmm. it is very common uh, to have that co-occurring uh, issue with OCD. And mm -hmm. for those people who don't fully understand what tics are, Ticks can be verbal or they can be physical. So someone with like a, a physical tick might like scrunch their eyes like this, or maybe, yeah. you know. You know, it's kind of making me want to do it too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, you're good. I'm just, it's fun. <laughs> but it's, but those are physical ticks. And then there's verbal ticks where someone might, you know, like sniff their nose mm -hmm. or clear their yes. throat or cough. And it can be even more serious than that. And then there's something called Tourette syndrome, where when someone has both physical and verbal tics, and there's 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 more to it, but basically um, that's Tourette's syndrome. So I just wanted to define some of those things for the audience. So so you got to a point where you are now taking uh, Prozac. You've been adjusting the doses. So mm -hmm. tell us. How did that go from there? Did it provide relief? Yes. So um, after we found out that I had OCD, um, my primary care phys I was actually really lucky that this happened. My primary care physician, she went on maternity leave and another doctor came in her place. And this doctor was a lady that also had OCD. Oh. Um, yeah. And I started talking to her and I was like, I have OCD. She was like, oh, wait, me too. And then, you know, we started talking to each other and she increased my dosage. Um, she oh, She's also on medication too. Um, and then I found out that I told her that I didn't want to take medication for the rest of my life. But she was like, this isn't um, something that is like going to go away per se. Like it's it's not a situational thing like for example depression like you may have somebody that passed away and you know it's a situational depression you know but in this case she was like this is um just kind of the way you think um and it, it might be there for a while you know if not forever um she she just said although it it'll be way easier to control and right now that's how I feel is I feel like I'm in control um I'm on 30 milligrams. I felt like I was on 40, but that felt like too much for me. I I started feeling like I wasn't feeling things enough. Mm -hmm. um, for example, like stuff that I would normally find funny or emotional, I wasn't really getting um, emotional or like my reactions were just muted, you know, and I, I wanted that back like a little bit. So we went down to 30 and right now I, I feel at my best, to be honest with you. Um, yes, I still get thoughts, but right now I know how to control it. I, I'll be like, okay, I'm used to this. I know exactly what this is, you know, just going to push it away. Um, but back in the day when I had no idea what it was, I was so scared and afraid. Um, and like, that's when I felt like I was losing control or not in control. And I think that's a big thing with OCD too. Um, you can't, you have to be comfortable with the uncertainty and not being in control sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, Cause that's what it is. You want it with OCD, you want to be in control of everything and you don't want anything to be uncertain. You want everything to be labeled. Um, 
So, but right now I'm, you know, obviously things bother me, um, but it's not going to make me have a panic attack. I'm, you know, I'm going to go on with my day. You know, I'll have worse days, um, just like everyone else. I'll have good days, but at least I feel balanced right now. You know, I'm not at the terrible end of the spectrum. You know, I'm just like floating in the middle, um, just like most people. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm happy with that. You know, I'm just happy that I'm, um, I feel kind of balanced right now. Great, great. Well, that's great that that's working out for you. So, so I have two more questions here. The, the first one is, what advice do you have for a loved one or family member of someone with OCD? How can they best be supportive? That's a great question. Um, um, I wish everyone would have somebody like my boyfriend, honestly, they, he, he was really understanding. Um, however, for my family, I could, I was afraid to tell them a little bit about how I felt. Um, cause I didn't want them to think, um, you know, they have expectations just like every mother or father has for their kids. But so I didn't want to disappoint them or like when I would kind of mention it, they, um, they would be like, oh, it'll pass, you know, it's, you know, it'll pass, it's, you're fine, or like, you know, stuff like that, so it, I would just say don't, um, I would just say kind of tune in, like, if, if your loved one is kind of bringing up things several times, I wouldn't just say it, it, it will pass, you know, there's definitely a pattern to OCD, and I would just kind of recommend that people pay attention to their loved one's specific pattern because I feel like OCD usually does have a pattern um so I would just pay attention to that and definitely not disregard if they because it's really really hard to even come out and like tell somebody how you're feeling because you're most of the time you're scared or guilty or you don't know what you're feeling so if someone's confident and um enough to come and tell you that you know they feel a certain way I would definitely validate their feelings and um you know just be supportive ask if they need help um or if they want to go talk to somebody um you know because I've kicked the can down the road many times and I feel like um my close ones kind of enabled me to do that because they were like it'll pass it'll pass you know um so yeah if, if if it doesn't pass and you feel like it's something then I would definitely trust that gut feeling um right Right. Yeah. So, so that's, that, that's helpful. And then, you know, my last question is one related to that, which is, so if somebody is watching this video and mm -hmm. your story is resonating with them and they're, they're recognizing, hmm, maybe I have OCD. What is your advice for someone with OCD or who believes they might have OCD you know, they're watching this video, they're now starting to think about it. What's your best mm -hmm. advice for them? Well, my best advice is, um, I was at that point as well, I was on my phone listening to a podcast. And that's when I um, resonated with somebody else um, who had OCD. And, and that's when I had a little light bulb moment. And honestly, that was one of the best days of my life, because I felt this immediate like relief because I was like, wow, like, that's exactly how I feel like, you know, and somebody else is going through this as well. Um, and I didn't think that, you know, I just thought my stuff was really, really specific. Um, and I was like, nobody's gonna understand nobody feels this way. But in reality, there's a lot of people that feel the exact same way. And they, they're just not coming out because they also think that um, nobody else feels this way. Um, because depression and anxiety or um other mental health disorders are talked about a lot and OCD is just kind of like you said regard um seen as um you know cleaning obsessions or you know washing your hands but it's definitely there's different types of it so my advice um would be that you know I was I was there at a certain point when I was listening um and, you know, if you have the opportunity to get the help, don't kick the can down the road. Because when I was finally diagnosed, that's when I started um, 
recovering and processing everything. And the, the worst times of my OCD was when I didn't know that I had OCD. So that's what I can say is, you know, figure out, kind of put a label on it, you know, because like I said, the uncertainty is terrible when it comes to OCD. Um, you know, putting that label on there um, and then listening to these types of podcasts online, you know, there's a lot of people that feel the exact same way. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's that's great advice. And I appreciate that. And I, I, I think sort of following up from your your own experience, I would say to to the audience that, you know, if you're seeing a doctor or you're seeing a counselor and it there the you know you believe that there's something else going on that they really haven't hit the mark it's not because they're a bad doctor or a bad counselor it's because they probably don't have any training in OCD and so bring up the issue with them or mm -hmm. seek out someone who has specific training in OCD just to get a second opinion um mm -hmm. but once you you know, if you do have OCD and then you are properly diagnosed, just like Rulin was saying, the relief is is palpable. You know, it's like, oh, mm -hmm. finally, I understand what's going on. And now I can start to do something about it. Exactly. It's huge. Yeah. It's really, really huge. Um, but like you said, I switched therapists twice, um, three times, actually, because um, the first one um, didn't really understand. We didn't click. Um you know, she, um, it's just, we just didn't click. And then the next one, um, she also wasn't really aware, um, even though we had great talks. Um, but finally, third time was the charm. And, you know, that's when um, it, it worked out for me. So definitely that's, that's big. You know, you may not always click um, with who you see and it's important to kind of get multiple opinions or, you know, reach out to other people. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story. It's so important that other people be able to hear from real live people who are, you know, just like them experiencing the same things because you can feel so alone out there when you don't know anybody. Mm -hmm. And I know that you are working towards uh, going for a PhD in psychology. Mm -hmm. So yes. we wish you the greatest of success with that. Um, Thank it's you an so exciting much. field. It's a lot of work, <laughs> but it's I'm an exciting ready. field. I'm ready. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, you know, I, um, if any, if anybody, um, you know, resonates with this and they want to talk more, I'm, my name's Rulin Guler. They can find me, um, online. You know, I would be happy to talk to anyone else as well. Um, you know, and I'm happy that we did this because this something like this was how I kind of started healing. And I hope, you know, someone else can watch this and do the same thing. Great. Fantastic. Well, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, uh, I always try and uh, tell people that we offer a free support group, OCD support group. They just have to go to stopmyocd.com and you can join us. I have a lot of people that come to the support group because they're questioning whether maybe they have OCD and then they learn, maybe they do or maybe they don't, but at least they learn what's going on. So that's it's, awesome. It's a free resource. You know, it's, it's, it's a great place to start. It's so great. So thank yeah. you for your time today. Oh, thank, and, you. thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Mm -hmm.